every crop has its Achilles heel. Some crops are affected at the leaves more, but in the case of wheat, the Achilles heel, the part that is most vulnerable, is the root. And as you can see on this slide, you can have three different diseases that sort of form a complex that affect the root, uh, that affect the root of wheat crops. So we're going to talk a little bit about two of them, and then our focus of research is, of course, take all. You can see that the, depending on the type of irrigation or the amount of uh, irrigation that happens, you can have a combination of three different types of disease, take all, rhizoctonia root rot, or pythium root rot. And the name take all is a colloquial name. It's a name. It's a common name. Um, and the name rhizoctonia and pythium are derived from the actual names of the fungi that cause those diseases. If you look to the top left there, you can see the reason why take all is not cause, called by the fungus name, because the name of the fungus that causes it is quite a mouthful. It's called Guamanomyces graminis vartritisi, but we call it GGT for short. So take all is a disease caused by GGT, which is a fungus. And how does the disease actually uh, manifest itself? You can see on the top left, right part of the slide there that you, you can see healthy wheat crops next to d crops that are infected with the GGT fungus causing take all. You can see the nice green parts that are healthy, and you can see the disease parts that are yellowing. What causes this disease? If you look on the bottom left slide, a part of the slide there, you can see healthy roots on the right that are tan colored, and then you have the dark, blackened, shriveled roots on the left that are affected by take all. And if you take a closer look at the slide, at the slide if you see the inset right, right at that point, right there, um, you can see that the fungus is actually growing inside the root. Basically, what the fungus does is grow inside the root and choke off the water supply to the plant. That's what take all looks like. Now, remember, the farmer has to deal with other diseases as well. So if the farmer also has rhizoctonia in the soil, the disease will look a little bit like what you see on the right side of that slide. Um, and that is you have bald patches. And if you look at the root, the roots are little stubby roots that are um, basically pinched off, and then they fall off, and you get those little stubs that you see at the top there. So depending on how much irrigation is used, you get a different combination of these three diseases, and the farmers have to deal with how to, how to handle that disease. So the fungus GGT grows into the root of the wheat plant, chokes off the water supply. Why is water so important for the, for the crop? If you remember back to when you learned photosynthesis, there was the light reaction, and then there was a Calvin-Benson cycle. And the light reaction involves the electrons moving from photosystem two as it gets kicked off when it's hit by light, and going through the electron transport chains. And if you remember, the electron transport, the, the photosystem two is missing an electron, and that electron gets replaced by a process called photolysis. But water is broken down, the electron enters the photosystem too, and oxygen is released, the hydrogen ions go in to form the hydrogen ion gradient that eventually leads to the production of ATP. If there's no water, the electron doesn't get released from the water, and it does not enter the photosystem too, and therefore the production of ATP cannot happen. Now, when you're learning this as part of photosynthesis, you're probably thinking, why do I need to know this? Well, here's the reason why. Dan Kegel was a farmer who started growing wheat in his farm in eastern Washington in about 2000, at about 2004. In 2004, 2005, 2006, things were going fine. Then in 2007, his yield just plummeted to nothing. And he lost in one field, in one, one year, he lost $65,000. That one obscure reaction not happening in the roots and in the plants of his field made him lose $65,000. Every reaction that you learn about in your classes has some such connection to the real world. It's just that we never have enough time to talk about it with you. 
And I want you to keep that in mind as you learn all of those uh, you know, esoteric reactions that you have to memorize. So let's think a little bit about how we would solve this problem. How would you control this disease? And I would say stop at this point and maybe have a discussion about how would you control the disease. Hopefully you've had a discussion about how to control this disease. And the, the ideas that you've come up with are really very similar to the ideas that the farmers and scientists have come up with to combat this disease. Um, of course, our first go-to solution for a lot of diseases is chemical control. So you can use fungicide or pesticides. Um, that has been tried, but it hasn't been very effective. Even if we could find a good fungicide, as we understand the deleterious effects of these fungicides and pesticides, we're trying to get away from the use of this because of all the ha other harm that these things do. Another option, which you may or may not have thought about, is that you, you know, the stubble that is left, the stuff that is left on the ground after the uh, harvest, can simply be burned. And that's a very effective way of controlling the disease, except that it, of course, causes severe air pollution. And in fact, there is a ban in eastern Washington from burning these fields. Another way to do it is crop rotation. That is, you try to put in a different crop, which of course disrupts the fungus, and therefore you can control the disease that way. Now, there are, though it's a biologically a smart solution, economically there are problems with it. Number one, if you're a farmer and you've spent a lot of money buying the, the seeds and the equipment to do one kind of crop, and you now have to uh, buy all of the material for a second type of crop, it gets very expensive. A second issue is, remember what we talked about, where this, where this crop is sold. It's sold to markets in Asia. And a lot of times how you deal with that is you sell your crop for the next five years. And if you say you're going to give them wheat, and two years later you tell them you're going to give them potatoes, they're not going to be too happy about that. So economically, this is not a, not a very useful um, strategy, even though biologically it makes sense. Another way to do this would be to develop resistant varieties, either by traditional breeding or by uh, genetic modification as we know it today. Um, unfortunately, that's not been very successful either. Another very effective mechanism is by tilling. So if you disturb the soil, the fungus gets disturbed, and you can actually um, get the disease under control. But as you remember, as the picture shows on top there, uh, eastern Washington is rolling hills. And if you disturb that soil, then you're going to cause something that's a bigger problem than even the disease. This, if, you've been, if you've driven in eastern Washington in summer, you see those dust devils that are following your car. That's that golden soil actually literally being blown away. And once it's blown away, there is no getting it back. It's lost forever. In fact, there are parts of eastern Washington where you can see the bedrock where the soil is completely removed. Now remember we talked about how irrigation is used as a way to um, grow this crop in eastern Washington. That irrigation also tends to cause soil erosion. So there is actually pressure on the farmer to do what is called no-till or low-till. That is absolutely do, do, not to disturb the soil so that you don't end up losing the soil to erosion. So where does that leave us? We may have some options here by something that nature has, has invented, and that's a biological method of control. There is a method of control that is biological, but it needs work, and that's where our research project comes in.